We're going to talk about allergy and um, asthma, rhinocytosinus, and a little bit of drug allergy. And when you think of allergy and rhinocytosinus, if you want to look at that characterization, um, you can look at this, or I call it the, e the itchy, sneezy, and wheezies. Okay, because that's exactly what you're looking for. Do they have things like chronic rhinorrhea? Do they have itching? Do they have eye or nasal symptoms? Most of these are IgE mediated. And so there is a lot of crossover between rhinosinusitis and asthma and allergy. So therefore, the concept is, is if we can manage one, we often can manage both because the pathophysiology is similar. And how do you diagnose allergy? Again, history and physical. If the patient says, you know, doc, starting March 15th, I start having these symptoms and they go until the 1st of June, what do you think it is? And you get a pretty good environmental history, it's not that hard to say, gee, this looks like allergy. Mimics are things like URIs, foreign bodies, those sort of things. But the physical exam a lot of times will help you with the, the things like ocular um, it, it congestion, so you get the allergic shiners, the allergic salute, you know, all the way through, nasal crease, Denny's lines, all may be helpful. You look at mucosa, it's kind of boggy or pale or sometimes bluish. It's in the differential, is it a viral URI? Is it bacterial sinusitis? Is it a vasomotor symptom where they don't have all of the history of allergy, but they've got nasal congestion? They may have sneezing. If you look, they don't have any eosinophilia in the nasal secretions, but they're triggered by things like spicy meals, um, cold weather, um, new fabrics. So some patients will come in and say, I go to the fabric store and my nose runs. They're not crazy. They may have vasomotor symptoms. Again, you can also get non-allergic rhinitis with eosinophilia, which is similar to allergy in the sense that you have similar symptoms and they have eosinophils, but it's not necessarily IgE-mediated. Um, medications can cause a lot of the allergic symptoms. Um, pregnancy. How many of you had a pregnant woman that complains they always have a cold? It's estrogen-mediated. And finally, foreign bodies or tumors sometimes, especially unilateral symptoms in little kids, you may want to think of foreign bodies. Treatment based on the patient's symptoms. The patient is the partner here, and you want to find out what it is that bothers them, what's the majority of their symptoms, and how can we handle that. So if they complain of ocular symptoms, it may make sense to use a medicine targeted toward the ocular condition as opposed to using systemic anti. Uh, histamines. If most of their things are decongestion and rhinorrhea, maybe using a nasal uh, symptom may be useful. If they're both, you may need to use the oral antihistamines. I liken allergy medication treatment to the smorgasbord approach. You could take a lot of one or a little of everything. It depends on what the patient wants. So we, we can use things like internasal chromalin or nasal steroids. We can use um, drops in you know, nasal, or sorry, ocular chromalin, or we can use an ocular steroid if we have to. You, the obvious first thing would be avoid the allergen. Now, that's not always easy if it's environmental. Um, but, you know, if every person who has a, a cat allergy raises cats, you're going to have a problem. And so maybe the, the, they need to look at um, getting rid of some of the things that could contribute to that. I find that extremely difficult. I have patients that would rather give up their child than their dog. Um, you can use leukotriene inhibitors. Um, they may be useful as an adjuvant. Um, if they um, fail or the symptoms are severe or there's environmental or occupational reasons, you might even consider immunotherapy and testing. Sort of a caveat about that, I have patients that want to come in and be immunotested. And I say, are you going to use allergy shots? Oh, no, I don't want shots. Then why spend $800, stick yourself 100 times on the back, itch like crazy for two days, to do nothing with that information. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If you get familiar with your allergy seasons where you practice, you can predict what they're allergic to. You can predict their skin test. So in Michigan, I, people come in and they start complaining about symptoms from March till about mid-May. I know that that's grass followed by trees, followed by weeds. If they have perennial symptoms, it's probably dust, dust mite, cockroach, or indoor mold. And so you can do it. When I was doing allergy as an as a Air Force officer here at um, Texas at Wolford Hall, we had patients coming in in December, and I'm going, what's in December? In December, we got snow. It was mountain cedar. So you have to know your allergy uh, uh, 
sort of seasons, and you can sort of predict your skin tests. Um, you can get allergic eye symptoms. One of the more impressive ones is this vernal con carato conjunctivitis. It looks like something out of a horror science fiction movie. They got this gelatinous looking eyes. They're inflamed. They got periorbital edema. They look horrible. You treat them for a couple of weeks. They don't get better. You send them to your ophthalmologist who does the same thing, switches the steroid, and they get better in three weeks. They think you're a clown and he's a hero. It's the natural history of the disease because it takes about um, four or five weeks to resolve. Um, you can look at using vasoconstrictors. You can look at um, steroids or mast cell stabilizers. As I said, the role for allergy testing is if you're going to take that information and do desensitization therapy. It can tell you or it can confirm what you already believe. So if they tell you they've got symptoms in August, at least in Michigan, I know that's ragweed, probably timothy weed, maybe pokeweed. Okay, but though, and I, so I'm not surprised if my skin test is positive. I'd be more surprised if it wasn't. Um, you can do in vivo or in vitro testing, so you can do the actual skin test, prick skin test, or you can do the RAST test um, to detect the IgE and serum. They're actually pretty good, and they're actually not bad for some of the food allergies. We don't do skin scratch tests much because most of the time they, they give a false positive, especially if people tend toward dermatographic skin. So you, you really want to do the, uh, uh, skin, the skin prick test where they actually are using a drop of the antigen and you prick through that antigen and you're rated both the cyst his histamine and saline controls and rate them one to four reaction for the wheel and flare. Intradermal is done more for things like Hymenoptera and Vespid insect, uh, stinging insect allergies. There are higher false positive rates, and there are also higher anaphylaxis. So most of the time, um, even if you do skin testing, the intradermals for things like stinging insects often are best done with the allergist. Why it's expensive to do one person, usually they'll line up five or 10 people and do them all at the same time because the antigen's expensive. Again, contraindications for skin testing, if you have dermatographic skin, it's hard to rate wheels and flares if they flare just when you touch the skin. So you have a harder time for that. If they've got um, generalized eczema, it's hard to find an area that isn't eczematous and do that skin testing. If they're pregnant, you don't want to begin skin testing. Obviously, if they have anaphylaxis, you've got two patients to worry about. And obviously, if the patient isn't able to cooperate. So I have parents that want to come in and get their two-year-old skin tested. Nothing is more uncooperative than a two-year-old, right? Um, if you're going to do the in vitro testing, that's where it may be useful. You could, all you need of them to cooperate is a blood test. Um, it does quantify the antigen allergy specific IgE, um, and it works um, fairly well. It's a little bit more expensive. I'm not sure it's three to five times more, but it's certainly a little bit more than the in vivo testing. And what we're, what we're gail, uh, getting this information for is if you're going to use allergy desensitization. Um, where you essentially give them low doses of their allergic allergen and you build up a, a blocking antibody. So you can do that if they failed pharmacology. If they're still having uh, symptoms or it's cost effective, there are some uh, areas where you'll do immunotherapy because it's uh, occupationally required. Again, going back to my Air Force experience, Pilots could get immunotherapy with allergic rhinitis, rhinosinusitis, because they can't take an antihistamine and fly a $15 million um, F-15. It's just not considered a good thing to crash those. But they can get waivers to fly for immunotherapy. And let me tell you, the last thing you want to do is ground a pilot. Um, they really, that's their whole life. So we, it is effective. The effectivity for the patient can be anywhere from 10% to almost all symptoms resolved. And you can't predict where they're going to fall on that spectrum. So some patients will get a great deal of benefit. Some people will say, you know, after I'd done this for three years, my symptoms are 10% better. Gee, that wasn't worth it. But you don't know, and it takes about a year to really see the effect. So if people think it's a miracle, it isn't. It takes somewhere around a year to 18 months to develop its effect, and you usually do the immunotherapy for about two to three years. You don't want to do it with their exacerbated in their asthma, because that may precipitate it. Um, if they're steroid-dependent asthma, you may not want to consider immunotherapy. And they need to follow a schedule. They have to come in on a, on a frequent basis. The person that shows up once every other month is probably not a good candidate for immunotherapy because you may see these people weekly, then biweekly, then monthly for maintenance. 